Hello and welcome to session number eight of Communication English. Today we will be taking a look at several writing skills. Let's first talk about effective writing skills. The purpose of written communication is to capture your reader's attention and get your point across clearly. Ultimately, when you communicate in writing, you're helping the reader understand your perspective on a topic. There are certain qualities that all effective written communication shares. And if you add these elements to your writing, your work will be more powerful. Now, what is the importance of effective written communication? In some ways, written communication is even more important than spoken communication. Unless it is being recorded, regular speech does not last. However, written communication is a record and people may refer back to it later. This means that in addition to creating a connection with your audience, you need to consider the lasting impact of what you write. Think about how it will be perceived by your audience initially, as well as the impact that it can and will leave. There are five C's of effective written communication. Now, good communication depends on the audience, the topic, your purpose in communicating and other factors. However, all effective written communication has some characteristics in common. The first one is connection. Good written communication forms a connection between the reader and the writer. The second, clarity. Effective written communication is clear and easy to understand. The third C is cause. The cause or reason for writing needs to be clear to both the writer and the reader, including any specific actions that you require from your audience as part of the communication. Then comes the fourth C, which is conciseness. Good written communication sticks to the point and does not include lots of extra information. It needs to be terse, succinct, brief. And finally, correctness, the last C. To be effective, written communication should use the correct tone, inoffensive language, and of course, appropriate grammar. Now let's take a quick look at the elements of effective writing. Effective writing allows the reader to thoroughly understand everything that you're saying. Here are a few tips that can help you. First and foremost, know your goal and state it clearly. Do you want the reader to do something for you or are you merely passing along information? Do you want a response from the reader or do you want him to take some action? Effective written communication has a clear purpose, and that purpose is communicated to the reader. Explain this in extremely clear terms. Second, use the correct tone for your purpose. Tone can help your writing be more effective. Certain forms of communication, like memorandums and proposals, for example, need a formal tone. Writing to someone you know well would require a more informal tone. The kind of tone depends on the audience and the purpose of the writing. Third, keep language simple. Do not overuse cliches or jargon and expressions or try to impress with big words. This can make the reader work harder and you want to make it easy to understand what you're saying. Point number four, stay on topic and keep it concise. Effective written communication stays on the topic. Avoid information that is not relevant. Clarity is key. Less is more when it comes to length. Keep sentences and paragraphs short and concise since long complicated sentences will slow the reader down. Leave out words that do not contribute to the main focus of the communication. Number five, use the active voice. Using the active voice will strengthen your writing. It's easier to understand sentences that are written in the active voice. For example, I caught the ball is more direct and easy to understand than the ball was caught by me. Active voice will engage the reader and keep his or her information. Point number six, have someone proofread your writing. 
Good grammar and punctuation are very important. It's a good idea to have someone else proofread your writing before you send it. If you cannot do that, then try reading it out aloud. Even though you may be very confident in your grammatical skills, please remember that it's very easy to make mistakes and therefore proofreading is a step that you should not avoid or overlook. Finally, practice different types of written communication. There are many types, including emails, memos, business letters, blogs, websites, press releases, and more. Practice writing a variety of documents to improve your written communication skills. Like anything else, becoming a good, good writer takes practice. We are moving on now to something called paragraph writing. We've all done this before, but just let's take a quick look at some skills which will enhance your writing abilities. A paragraph, as we all know, is a collection of sentences all related to a central topic, idea, or theme. Paragraphs act as structural tools for writers to organize their thoughts into an ideal progression, and they also help readers process those thoughts effortlessly. Imagine how much harder reading and writing would be if everything was just one long block of text. There's a lot of flexibility when it comes to writing paragraphs, but if there's one steadfast rule, it's this. Paragraphs should relate to one main topic or point. The paragraph itself often contains multiple points spanning several sentences, but they should all revolve around one core theme. Just as sentences build upon each other to communicate the paragraph's core theme, paragraphs work together to communicate the core of the theme of the writing as a whole. There are different types of paragraphs. We shall be taking a look at four such types. The first one is called expository paragraphs. Essays, academic papers, and journalistic articles mainly use expository or introductory paragraphs to explain an individual point. These paragraphs rely on data, statistics, or citations from other sources to present facts and build up to an irrefutable conclusion. The second is descriptive paragraphs. Common in fiction and certain styles of journalistic or other nonfiction writing, a descriptive paragraph contains various details of the same thing, with each sentence adding new insight. A paragraph in a horror novel, for example, might describe how it feels to walk around the woods alone. No matter the context, descriptive paragraphs are meant to provide the clearest picture for your subjects. The third type is persuasive paragraphs. For editorials and opinion pieces, persuasive paragraphs are meant to convince the reader of a specific point with each sentence presenting evidence or reasoning to support that point. Like expository paragraphs, persuasive paragraphs may contain data and statistics, but here these work to support an opinion rather than verify a fact. The fourth type are narrative paragraphs. If you're telling a story, fiction or nonfiction, you'll need to break up the action into smaller segments so that your readers don't get confused. That's the purpose of narrative paragraphs. They break up sequential actions into related chunks with one leading into the next so that the reader can remain focused on the storyline. They don't use evidence or supporting arguments like other paragraph types, but still abide by the main rules of paragraphs about unity. Now let's take a quick look at the different constitutive parts of a paragraph. Paragraphs use a simple but efficient structure consisting of four major parts. The first is the topic sentence. Also known as the paragraph leader, your topic sentence should introduce the concept and communicate what the paragraph is about. Be careful not to squeeze your entire point into this first sentence. You just need to say enough so that the reader knows what the rest will be about or what is going to follow. The second bit is development. 
Your second and maybe third sentences are where you elaborate on your point. All the non-essential information that didn't fit in your topic sentence goes here. The goal is that the reader fully understands the point. So feel free to include citations or assertions from other sources for stronger communication. Point number three is support. Here's where you get down to anything that confirms your initial statement. Present your evidence, data, statistics, logical conclusions, persuasive opinions, real life or hypothetical examples, etc. And finally, you will end with a summary. You want to end by summing up or evaluating your main point. Ensure that your readers can draw a conclusion from your argument. That's important. And remember, there are no strict rules on how long or short a paragraph can be, but typically three to five sentences should suffice. Sometimes you may opt for only a single sentence to add emphasis or effect, while other times you'll need more than five sentences to present all your evidence. Use your discretion, but remember, shorter is always better than writing something that's too long. We now move on to the next type of writing, which is letter writing. As we all know, letter writing can be majorly divided into formal and informal types of letters. Let's take a quick look at formal letters first. A formal letter is one written in an orderly and conventional language and follows a specified stipulated format. These letters are written for official purposes only Examples of official letters could include ones written to the management, to the HR, to an employee, to the principal of the school or college, etc. The formal letter writing format requires some specific rules and conventions. The language of the letters should be very professional, and the format here should help in relaying the content of the letter in a formal way. Here are a few tips on writing formal letters. First of all, address or greet the concerned person properly by using terms like respected or dear, sir or madam. Second, always mention the subject of writing the letter. Third, be concise in your letter. Write the reason for writing the letter in the first paragraph itself. Do not stretch the letter too long. Remember that you need to capture the attention of your reader. Fourthly, the tone of the letter should be extremely polite. Fifth, write in a proper format and take care of the presentation. Sixth, mention the address and the date correctly. Seventh, mention the name and designation of the recipient correctly. And finally, the closing of the letter should always be with gratitude. Use statements like, thank you for considering the contents of the letter, and then finally, always write yours sincerely or yours truly along with your name and signature. Here is a quick slide that show you the parts of a formal letter. It should begin with the sender's address, followed by the rate, the address of the receiver, the subject line, the salutation, the body of the letter, the complimentary close, the signature, full name and designation of the sender, and finally, names and designations of people to whom copies are sent. Here is an example of a relatively good formal letter. Now moving on to informal letters. An informal letter is a non-official letter that we use to write to our friends, family, or relatives. These letters are personal and are definitely not used for official purposes. There could be many reasons which we may have for writing these letters. It could be informing your family about some achievement, sharing some personal news, or it could be a condolence letter. There are various ways of doing this. Since the letter is informal, the salutation that is used is usually dear. Yeah, so you might write dear mama, dear papa, uh, dear chinky, if it's a sister, right, whatever it is. Now, unlike formal letters, of course, we don't mention a subject line at all, but the addresses of the senders and the receivers have to be mentioned. Now, like we said before, 
There could be a variety of topics yeah, that are used to write informal letters. Here are a few of them. You could be inviting a friend for a ceremony, say for a birthday, calling a friend for a trip for holiday. You could be apologizing or congratulating or informing. Right, these are some of the various reasons why you might write an informal letter. Now the format of the informal letter is relatively simple. It should include the following. Address of the sender, date of writing the letter, don't forget this. Address of the receiver, your salutation or greeting, body, conclusion, and your signature. Now we are moving on uh, to the next topic, which is called essay writing. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this and that you've been writing essays for a very long time. But here are a few steps to make essay writing easier and better comprehensible. Let's take a quick look at this. First and foremost, read and understand the topic. Know exactly what is being asked of you. It is also a good idea to dissect the central theme into parts. The second step of writing an essay should be planning. A lot of us dive into the essay the minute we read the topic. That's not a good idea. Brainstorm and organize your ideas. This will make it easier when you are writing your essay. It's a good idea to chart out ideas, basic ideas and supporting details as well. Thirdly, use and cite resources. Do your research. Use quotes, paraphrase from your sources, but remember, do not plagiarize. So copy pasting from the internet is a bad, bad idea. Write a draft, a rough copy. Drafts are always a good idea to get rid of substandard points. And this also helps in shaping up the final essay. Make a strong thesis. The thesis or main argument of the essay is the most important thing you will ever write. Ensure that it is a strong point. Proofread. Read your response carefully to make sure there are no mistakes and that you don't miss anything. Right? Proofreading is an important part of all forms of writing. Now, a basic essay has the five following points, right? It will have five paragraphs. Usually, you will have an introduction, which takes up the first paragraph. You will have the body, which would take between one to three. And finally, you will have the conclusion. Now, the introduction. The principal purpose of the introduction is to present your position. This is also known as the thesis or argument of the issue at hand. Now, before you get to this thesis statement, the essay should always begin with a hook that grabs the reader's attention and makes them want to read on. Examples of effective hooks include relevant quotations. For example, no man is an island, or surprising statistics, three out of four doctors report that. It could also mean that you can begin on an interesting note by narrating an anecdote. All of these function as hooks. Only when the reader's attention is hooked should you move on to the thesis. The thesis should be a clear one sentence explanation of your position that leaves no doubt in the reader's mind about which side you are from the beginning of the essay. Following the thesis, you should provide a mini outline which previews the examples you will use to support your thesis in the rest of the essay. Not only does this tell the reader what to expect in the paragraphs to come, it also gives them a clearer understanding of what the essay is about. Finally, designing the last sentence in such a way that it seamlessly moves the reader from the first paragraph of the body to the next of the paper. The body paragraphs. The middle paragraphs of the essay are collectively known as the body paragraphs. And the main purpose is to spell out in detail the examples that support your thesis. In the first body paragraph, you should use your strongest argument or most significant example. The first sentence should be the topic sentence that directly relates to the examples listed in the outline of the introductory paragraph. A one sentence body paragraph that simply cites examples is not enough. Even the most famous or well-known examples require a context. So ensure that this context is provided 
and is clear to the reader. Having done that, you then also need to explain exactly why this example is relevant to your thesis. The importance of this step cannot be understated, as this is the whole reason for providing the example in the first place. As you move on through the other paragraphs, you will come to the conclusion. Although the conclusion comes at the end of your essay, it should not be seen as an afterthought. The final paragraph represents your last chance to make your case and therefore make the most of it. One way to think of the conclusion is to think of it as a second introduction because it does in fact contain many of the same features. While it does not need to be too long, four well-crafted sentences should be enough, it can make or break the essay. Effective conclusions open with a concluding transition. You know, when you start by saying in conclusion or in the end or finally, and an allusion to the hook used in the introductory paragraph. Remember the hook? You have to mention it again at the end. After that, you should immediately provide a restatement of your thesis statement. Now, what you're doing here basically is you're repeating your central idea over and over again. You can either use the same language or you can reuse certain words and phrases. This causes what is called an echoing effect. It not only reinforces your argument, but also ties it nicely to the second key element of the conclusion, which is a brief review of the three main points from the body of the paper. And having done all this, the final sentence of your essay should be a kind of a global statement, right? It should call to attention and it should signal the reader that the discussion has come to an end, a satisfactory end. We move on now to the last point, last segment of this particular lecture, and it's called preparing a curriculum writing. Now I'm sure we all know what a CV is, right? A CV is a document used when applying for jobs. It's also known as a bio data or a resume. It allows you to summarize your education, skills and experience, enabling you to sell your abilities to a potential employer. Alongside your CV, employers also usually ask for a cover letter, so beware of that. A standard CV should not be any longer than two sides of an A4 size sheet, depending on your experience. While it's important to keep your CV concise, you should also avoid selling your experiences short. To save space, include only the main points of your education and experience. Stick to relevant information and don't repeat what you've said in your covering letter. If it's not relevant to the job you're applying for, delete any bit of information. And if it's an old detail from 10 years ago, say, then summarize it. Now, this is what every curriculum writing should include. Your contact details, including your full name, your home address, your mobile number and email address, your profile, a profile is a concise statement that highlights your key attributes and help you stand out in a crowd. Usually placed at the beginning of a CV, it picks out a few relevant achievements and skills while expressing your career aims. A good CV should focus on the sector you're applying to as your cover letter will be job specific. Keep CV personal statements short and precise, nothing more than 100 words. Then your education, list and date, date is important. All previous education, including professional qualifications. Place the most recent first, so they should be in descending order, not ascending. Include qualification type, grades and dates. Mention specific modules, but only where they are relevant. Include your work experience, list it in reverse date order. So the latest should be the first. Mention everything that is relevant to the job that you're in applying for, including the title, the name of the company, how long you were with the organization and the key responsibilities that you held. Mention your skills and achievements. List foreign languages that you speak and IT skills that you can competently use. The key skills that you list should be relevant to the job and be truthful. 
Don't exaggerate your abilities as you'll need to back up your claims at the interview and eventually in the course of the job. Your interests or your hobbies. Now, please remember that socializing, watching movies, reading, listening to music, going for long walks are not going to catch a recruiter's attention. Relevant interests can, however, provide a more complete picture of who you are as well as give you something to talk about at the interview. Examples would include things like maybe writing your own blog or newsletters if you want to be a journalist, being part of a drama group if you're planning to get into sales, and your involvement in something like climate change activism if you're looking at an environmental job. If you do not have any relevant hobbies or interests, please omit this section. It's better to omit than to lie and get caught out at the interview stage. And finally, references. You will need to provide the names of references at this stage. Prior employers or academic faculty members who taught you would be a good idea. Provide details like names, designations, and contact details of the references so that people can get in touch if and when required. And that is how your CV should end. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next class. Have a good day.